Okay, welcome to episode four of uh, Gravitational Waves in a Nutshell. Um, we start, as in uh, on Netflix, with a recap of uh, the, the last episode, everything that, uh, the cliffhangers that I left there. And so <laughs> we, uh, we look at the physical content and information content of binary waveforms. We saw that they depend on uh, 15 parameters. Some are, a few of them are astrophysically, astrophysical, uh, let's say the masses and spins of the black holes. Uh, the rest uh, are configuration parameters that describe the relative position of the source with respect to the detector and uh, the, the orientation of the source itself and some uh, initial space and initial time that also place the event and the spiral in, uh, on, on the time axis, let's say. Um, I describe gravitational wave detection as, uh, as the idea of uh, selecting a, a data model. And uh, for detection itself, uh, the, the selection compares a model that includes only noise with a model that includes also signal. Um, uh, this is easiest perhaps to see as, a, as the idea of match filtering, uh, which, we, which is where you have a theoretical template uh, of the signal and you compute the correlation. So trying to match the phase of the signal in the data. Uh, that gets you positive integral and therefore gets you statistical significance. Um, that's, uh, that's the theory and in, th in theory everything is always normal and Gaussian. I in the real world you can't believe your uh, normal statistics and so you, uh, you proceed with more um, empirical uh, procedures and uh, in particular the detection background which uh, in theory is just a simple error function just an integral of, a, uh, of the noise sampling distribution, which is normal. Uh, in practice, you want to measure it uh, by making sure that there is no signal in the data. And uh, in LIGO 1, uh, the classic procedure to do that is time shifts, where you request uh, coincident detection between uh, multiple observatories, but you shift time so that there can be no coincidence. Uh, as a result, all that's, that's left must, must be a spurious, a, a random uh, uh, coincidence. <laughs> okay. It must, must, be, must be just a random effect. Um, moving on to parameter estimation, we saw that's also based on the modeling of noise, that's based on, uh, uh, on the idea of building a likelihood on the data from your understanding of uh, the noise spectrum. Uh, we typically go to, since uh, there's only one event, uh, the, the, the information, uh, astrophysical information is somewhat hard won, uh, you have to match all the cycles and so on. One generally does Bayesian uh, inference. And uh, the methods of choice to, to then explore the Bayesian posterior are stochastic methods. <laughs> okay, um, you can see trends also in spins. You see some uh, spin misalignment. Um, as, uh, however, as, as you get more data from these catalogs, you also get more papers from the theorists, right? So the, the promise before the detection was uh, um, if we see aligned spins, that's a, a binary formation in the field. If we see filtered spins, that's binary formation in the uh, in a cluster. Uh, but now, now, of course, that you see both, okay, you see both things, maybe it's a mixture of the two populations, but the, uh, the people who do uh, binary formation in a field has, have uh, decided they, they can allow for, they can make some tilt. Uh, even if they can, they can also always bring in a, a triple, right, which will mix up things. 
and the people in the class in 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 the cluster in dynamical formation uh, uh, think they can uh, they can also get alignment. So it's it's all um, at the moment it's um, it's confusing, uh, but it's uh, it's interesting and lots of uh, uh, opportunities for theorists. Let's say. And finally, uh, it's only one item here, 0.6, but we spent some time talking about uh, pulsar timing array detection, um, detection of gravitational waves using pulsar timing arrays, uh, where again everything is a Gaussian, is Gaussian, everything is a Gaussian process, and there you're modeling ma many types of unknowns at the same time, because you don't control the experiments, right? You build your experiment using uh, in, in pulsars as a, as a, a clock. Um, but the, I argued that you can get gravitational wave detection from a very specific signature, which is the fact that uh, a, an isotopic background will generate uh, signals in pulsars at an angle with a very precise uh, correlation structure, known as Hellings down spatial correlations. Okay, that's where we left it. Now um, I'm going back to. Um, for today, I'll go back to gravitational wave uh, uh, generation, but uh, in uh, precise, precise calculations of gravitational wave generation. And you know, I um, the the classic theory for this is uh, post-Newtonian the post-Newtonian approximation and post-Newtonian formalism for binaries, uh, of which uh, Blanchet, Damour, there were well, others, lots lots of French names. In, in that, and I, I, I just saw Luke yesterday, and uh, I know he also visits here, and uh, he, he has a beautiful review in 2015 that covers really the, the entire field and all the um, approximations and frameworks that uh, that it uses. So, um, also, you know, being in Paris, you go to museums and uh, you, you're inspired by the art that uh, that you see. And it, it struck me that you know the Blanchet Damour theory of postnetonia is, is like uh, Manet, you know, is is this, this beautiful, perfect, uh, uh, very very refined and very careful paintings that um, have a certain sadness to them. So it's, it's like the, the real world is complicated, right? Although although the painting is beautiful and perfect, there are lots of things to take into account. Um, you know, I, I, also, I also try to make up a joke based on uh, 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 the, the famous uh, picnic uh, painting, uh, which Filippo will remind me. Um, yeah, it's Le Dejeuner Soulet, but I couldn't come up with anything that was appropriate and, and not. Uh, so uh, let's not make that. But uh, so, so post Newtonian, I probably cannot do justice to it. But there, there was a, there's been all since uh, maybe 10 years ago. An alternative uh, way to, to to do the same calculation, which is more like Picasso, okay, where especially late Picasso, where he just does this uh, sketches things and so on, and that's it. It's right. It's there. It took him twenty seconds, uh, and and it's very instinctive. And and so this is uh, the effective field theory approach, I would say, to uh, where some things are right just because they're right. And uh, now I'm not a field theorist. So, so, so on some things I have to believe the field theorists when they say that this is right and this works. Uh, now there's a, you know the two the two methods or more than two methods have checked each other. They they, they they agree on our results. They converge, and some of the techniques from EFT have been taken up also in the in the more classic uh, method. So, but it's uh, it's kind of fun to look at, and uh, uh, this is my attempt to, to to render it. We'll see how it goes. But uh, as we saw. The problem of the uh, binary in GR uh, is that it's uh, it's daunting when when you look at it because there are so many things that uh, that are moving and dynamical at the same time. Uh, it's not just the potential, just that the force modeled by by a potential. There's the field with all of the degrees of freedom. Um, the bodies themselves are can be complicated, uh, strongly gravitating uh, things like black holes. Um, and then, uh, and then you, you you want to model waves, which uh, you know you get at a distance, and so on. So, so lots of things going on at the, at the same time. Hard to disentangle them. Uh, but uh, as we saw in the idea of matched asymptotic expansions, which is where, which is a way to derive the quadruple formula by looking at a field that locally is quasi-Newtonian and, and slowly changing. 
and uh, the field in the wave zone, which instead is a relativistic field that's uh, uh, propagating at the speed of light and so on. And so you have two scales there, uh, one set by the size of your dynamical source and the other one set by the wavelength of the, um, um, of the, of the gravitational waves. And uh, uh, both those scales uh, allow you to do some, uh, some simplification and then you match them and uh, it's where you can, uh, you can bridge your local understanding of dynamics to the content of the gravitational waves. So the effective field theory approach relies on a separation of scales, uh, same, same thing, and, and it, it, uh, um, it uses that to, to, Im to implement the, uh, the overall logic of effective field theory which is you have high energy physics on uh, small scales. Uh, you don't see it because your experiment uh, and is sensitive to low energy uh, scales, longer scales, let's say. And, uh, and, and so you base your description, you build your description at a simpler low energy uh, level, but uh, you, uh, you find a way to encode the high energy uh, physics in low energy. Uh, operators, so just in, uh, in terms in the action that you can just write down by, by symmetry and, uh, and by requiring a model independence with respect to the high energy. And then you have this effective then description. Uh, you, you have somehow to, to bring in the high energy physics, which you can do two ways. One is uh, formally uh, integrating out the high energy degrees of freedom. So just, you know what they are the GR. You write them out, you do the integrals, and you're left uh, with your uh, simpler description. Or you can do a matching. So uh, with the idea there are some coefficients that you don't know, and you can uh, uh, either measure them if you have some experiment that, where uh, they, they affect a, a certain observable, or you can match them with, with a targeted uh, calculation that gets at the heart of what those, uh, uh, those coefficients mean. Um, then uh, uh, this EFT for post-Newtonian systems and waves has been described as a tower of uh, relativistic theories that I always found that a bit excessive because it's only two floors, <laughs> right? So it's, it's not much of a tower, it's more. But uh, so at the smaller scale, uh, we have, uh, let's say, isolated black holes coupled to gravity. We know a black hole is complicated. It's, it's a Schwarzschild or Kerr solution and so on. It can have excitations, it can respond to a background field, but the scale there is distances of the order of the mass, okay, in geometrized units. Uh, above that, uh, we want to see, we want to think of the black holes as a point particle coupled to a gravitational field, which gives it, gives a binary, for instance, its, uh, uh, its dynamics. Uh, if this was Newtonian, it would be just Kepler. There, the characteristic uh, uh, length scale is the orbital separation. R. And now between those two, just by the very theorem, you know, m over r is v squared. Okay, so we, uh, mv is typically smaller than one, even for binaries at the very end of their, uh, in spiral, it's of order 0.3, I think is what we what usually, um, so uh, this allows us to, uh, that's a small parameter then, and it's a small parameter that lets us separate those two scales. And then we go up to waves, gravitational waves. The, typical, the characteristic length scale is the wavelength. Um, and then again, uh, the ratio of the orbital, um, or orbital uh, separation to the wavelength of the scale is again the velocity. If you, if you just, uh, um, C is one here, okay, speed of light is one. So again, separation of scale that uh, uh, lets us uh, then describe the binary as a single object it's a composite object that uh, uh, is not just a point, but it has multiple moments, and it's those multiple moments that will be coupled to the gravitational waves. Okay, this is the general, the general scheme. And uh, uh, then uh, let, let's do the first, uh, the first step. How does one think of a black hole or another um, macroscopic object as a point particle? Okay, well, you start, uh, first term is, uh, is, is the simplest one. Oh, yeah, not my hand. First term is perhaps the simplest one. This is uh, just an integral of proper time. It what gets you geodesic motion of a point particle. Okay, in GR, uh, geodesic equation and so on. And then you start writing an action, okay, that includes all terms uh, that respect the symmetries 
in this case, we want something like, uh, you know, Lorentz symmetry. You may want a reparameterization symmetry with respect to the proper time. Uh, you can use the, uh, the velocity, you can use the acceleration of the field, probably not higher, it gives you problem in the action. Um, and then, uh, uh, so you, you, you write terms that use the, the, the gravitational field. So what happens is that, and this is one of those magic uh, field theory moves that uh, uh, you, get, you can get convinced by, is that uh, uh, the, the first few terms that you can imagine uh, writing, you can remove them by something known as field redefinition, which is the idea of changing the value of a field, in this case only on the word line of the particle that's coupled to it, that cannot affect uh, longer wavelength uh, observables, and so it cannot affect the physics that you see. But I, I think for most of those field redefinitions, it, it's, uh, they, they are equivalent to using the equations of motion to uh, plug them back in into the uh, action, and therefore you lose some terms. So you can, you know, you, um, so maybe it's not 20 seconds that you do everything, but you, you can convince yourself uh, to some satisfaction that the, the first terms that don't cancel out are terms that are quadratic in Riemann tensor, and actually here they're written in terms of vial tensor, but same thing. Uh, the first one is a term that's quadratic in, uh, um, in the electric part of the Riemann tensor, and you can interpret this as the uh, effect of tidal deformations of the, um, of the body by uh, a, a, a tidal field, okay? So, so th this is induced deformations that then uh, uh, couple to the, to the tidal field itself, and same story for the, um, for the magnetic part of uh, Riemann tensor. And now, if you look at, uh, uh, if you do a dimensional ana analysis, you see that uh, this uh, Riemann tensor includes uh, two derivatives of, um, two spatial derivatives. Uh, these spatial derivatives are, are of the order of the, um, the curvature, the curvature length. Um, and the coupling coefficients that you can build needs to be then uh, to be a, the fifth power of the, the size of this uh, of your spherical body. That's the only length scale you have that you can use to build here. You also have the mass. Uh, so then, if you if you can try to figure out what kind of force you get from these terms, uh, you get a, a fourth power. It's suppressed by the ratio of uh, size of the body to uh, curvature size by a fourth power. And uh, you can relate this using, again, the real theorem to an eighth power of the velocity, in, uh, uh, of the typical velocity here. That means that uh, these, uh, the first effect that's not point-like uh, in, uh, in your effective field theory for the word line for your, for your body comes in at the fourth, fourth post-Newtonian order, okay? So an eighth power of uh, post-Newtonian order is, to, is B squared. We'll see that in a moment. Um, for black holes, actually, it turns out that these two numbers, known as the tidal loft numbers, are actually zero because of uh, uh, fancy symmetries that <laughs> the black holes have. Uh, you do a matching calculation. You do a calculation where you immerse a black hole into an external tidal field, and you see how, uh, how the perturbation of the solution goes. And so, in fact, the, uh, the, the first correction comes in at, uh, at 6, at the 6 post-Newtonian post order. So there's a B12 there. Uh, did I do it right? I think so, yes. Uh, for Newton stars, you don't have this. And uh, uh, however, and you have a parameter here, which is the 1 over the compactness of the body, m over the size of the body. So uh, you, by this kind of broad dimensional analysis, you can convince yourself that for Newton stars, also this, this effect will be small, but they will not be small for a regular star or for even a white dwarf where this coefficient can be large, right? So it can re-enhance, and, and there you do need to, to, to worry about them. But this is the field theory justification for thinking of black holes at point particles effect. Yes? The operator to which uh, the point particle will be coupled, the, sorry, the, um, yeah, the next, uh, the leading operator in the case of Schwarzschild uh, black hole. Oh, so there. You, yeah. Um, I think it would be cubic in, cubic in the, in Riemann, I think, no? I don't know. I, I think it's either cubic in Riemann or uh, proportional to, yeah. 
a dot, a time derivative of Riemann squared, and possibly both of those together. We, I, I can look it up. Okay. So, uh, for for sure, the uh, the coefficients that couple to the uh, to the cubic term do not vanish for the black hole. And I don't know if they've been computed. Ah, study. to the cubic. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So you're sure? Okay, I see. I see. And what is this uh, reference, uh, Gali 2020? Uh, that's Chad Galli, who's my. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, I, I I've been pushing him to <laughs> to publish oh. this. It's a it's a set of lectures he gave like six years ago, and he's written them up, but he, he hasn't been happy with the, with them. So, but they can be asked by friends. So if you if you like them, I we can mm -hmm. ask him or one of you like them. Uh, I think that there are a bit uh, th there are several references for EFT. For instance, Porto has a very nice review. You can go to the original, to, to the thesis by Riva, right? And mm -hmm. uh, um, the way Chad does it tends to be closer to Blanchet and company uh -huh. uh, because he, he tries never to use H, for instance, and, and never uh, uh, works in geometric coordinates. And uh, um, so you describe, for instance, the idea of integrating out the field as Fokker action, which is what the, the, the classical people uh, call it. Okay. Um, so for someone someone like me, it's a bit easier to, to understand. Um, then, uh, however, you may want uh, to, to, to actually, so, so this is about induced okay, degrees of freedom, induced moments in, uh, in, in a spherical body. If the body is not spherical, if it's spinning, or if it has uh, uh, intrinsic uh, moments, such a quadrupole moment and so on, uh, coming from some uh, high energy, uh, small land scale uh, dynamic, you need you include more terms, and now you'd uh, you'd couple directly to the uh, to Riemann and to the to the derivatives of Riemann. And uh, the, uh, yes, uh, your effective action. Uh, I see that uh, you, in some sense, count the derivative. You order the, the, the various terms by counting the, deri uh, the derivative of the field uh, tensors. Yes. A increase, but also I see that you you consider so the the the, the speed the uh, acceleration. Mm -hmm. So why you, I mean could you you think about inserting uh, the, the third derivative? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. wh why not? Um, I think you can, but then you again you can start using the the leading order equation of motion to to write it as a. Ah, okay. Yeah, they uh, are, are which is okay. Also the okay. Strategy that that uh, okay, and, and company use. So are you uh, eliminated those degrees? Okay. Yeah, and that may have some consequences for your, you know, boundary conditions at minus infinity and so on. So so. Um, okay, going forward. So let's now worry about making uh, <laughs> making binary dynamics. So so doing the EFT where uh, we get rid of the field of the gravitational field and as a warm-up it's uh, it's kind of a, at least for me it's nice to to, to look back to just newton's uh, gravitation and try to do it this way which is of course massive overkill okay because newton didn't need any of this but uh, you can write an action for uh, point particles that are coupled uh, to the field this is uh, you know just the laplacian um, for the field this is the linear coupling uh, Euler-Lagrange gets you equations of motion. Uh, one is just Laplace equation for a point mass source. The other one is just the uh, acceleration of the point masses uh, from the gradient of the field. And now the way you solve this is with Green's function, uh, which is uh, again solves this equation for uh, basically a, a delta, uh, a delta solution. And if you if you take an integral solution in terms of Green's function. Uh, you can write the field, and you can integrate out uh, the. Uh, you can write the field basically as a simple function of the point particles, and the, the difference uh, and, and the distance. Sorry, the vector <laughs> to the to the point you want to probe, to the location of the point particle. And then if you you substitute this in the equation of motion, and you get an equation of motion that doesn't know about the field anymore, but just have the instantaneous action uh, that the, the instantaneous force from Newton. Okay, fine. Uh, this, this is all well known. Um, now we do the same thing and make it more formal and more uh, field theory-like. And uh, the idea is to build an effective action that is uh, a function only of the uh, word, line, word lines of the particles by substituting a solution for the field into the full 
action that involves the field as well. So same action, but this time we write it in momentum space, so the, der the spatial derivatives become just a, a multiplication by a, a, a wave vector. Um, the point uh, uh, coupling, point like local coupling to the field now has a, a, an exponential, uh, just uh, by Fourier transform. And now you can take a, a variation of the action and do a perturbative expansion. So you do, do the first and the second derivatives. And now you can think of the uh, solution of the field in terms of Green's function as applying a propagator, the inverse of the second uh, uh, functional derivative of the action, uh, to a source. Okay, and you, um, you write the formula, but, but you also paint a little diagram that, uh, that schematically uh, you, you know, represents these, uh, these quantities, the inverse of the second, uh, the coefficient basically of the field in, uh, in, in the variation and uh, the, the coupling to matter. And now you can, s the solution for the field looks like the product of uh, a, the propagator with the, the, the little word like diagrams with the nubs uh, that uh, the, the little, you know, mm. uh, segments there that express the coupling uh, to matter. Um, and so you can also, so you can write schematically the solution as, a, uh, you know, attaching a propagator to the, to the word lines. And now you can, uh, you can do this, uh, you, you, you can, uh, instead of uh, solving do the solution uh, uh, explicitly, you can go in and, and just rewrite the action in terms of uh, the, uh, the diagrams. Uh, and, uh, and when you do this, you, you close up the diagrams, you build, uh, uh, you see, diagrams that have no free propagator line. Um, these are the only ones that you can build, basically, uh, out of what you have, in, uh, out of the propagator and the, uh, the matter coupling in this linear theory. You still have uh, the, the standard uh, action for the, um, for the particles. And uh, in uh, a few theories would say that we're drawing all the connected three-level diagrams with no free lines. Okay, connected means you cannot uh, split a diagram in two uh, because all that does is multiply, multiply two, two diagrams together. And, uh, and now each of these maps back to an integral uh, with, the, with the propagator in simple form and with the matter coupling. And to a few theories, these are very quick to, they see this and immediately they can write it out. Uh, this integral, one over k squared, is uh, basically a Fourier transform and it gives you the familiar Newton's uh, interaction. The other one are interesting, right? This is uh, a, a, a field that is uh, sourced by a body and interacts back with the same point, uh, point particle, the same body. So if you write the corresponding integral, you get an infinity here. Uh, the, uh, you get a, an integral over dk3 of one over k squared. This is the UV divergence, ultraviolet. If you, if you set a, a cutoff for, the, for K, uh, you get a, a, something that's proportional to, to the power of K. And uh, in, um, in Blanchet, I don't know what Newton did. I guess he didn't worry about, uh, <laughs> he didn't, didn't worry about coupling the field to, to, the, uh, to the body itself. But uh, uh, if, if you're more formal about it, you can do partie fini, regularization, Hadamard, and so on. Uh, but a few theories would either say, okay, let's do a cutoff, and then I, I have a term that uh, becomes formally inf infinite, I can tuck it into the mass, do renormalization by redefining uh, the naked mass and the, uh, and the renormalized mass. Or you can do dimensional regularization. So you notice that uh, uh, you compute this integral in uh, an arbitrary dimension, d, and you notice that it's, uh, you only get the singularity where d is uh, four, three in this case, four, four. And uh, instead of taking the, the, that infinity, you, you take the analytic continuation of the, uh, the value of the integral as a function of the number of dimensions, and that, that, that is zero. Okay, so dimensional regularization has now been introduced also in the, in the classic uh, PN uh, formalism. It works very well. It matches more sophisticated other procedures. Okay, so <coughs> this is a bit Picasso, right? So you, have, you, you do all this simple instinctual thing, you do all possible uh, combinations, and, but they, they have a precise meaning that uh, gets you what you need. Now, let's do it for actually for GR. Okay, for GR, we go back to 
a perturbative expansion of the field. We write, uh, we, we do it on a flat background. So the metric is going to be Lorentz plus two perturbations, okay? There's going to be a perturbation at the scale of the binary that is sourced by, by the local dynamics of the binary. And there's going to be a perturbation at the scale of the um, gravitational wavelength uh, which is the one that will give us gravitational waves, okay? And that, uh, that will be self-propagating in the end. Um, it's actually, we're worrying about the binary, so we forget about this H a little bit, and uh, uh, start our action will be Einstein-Hilbert, standard action for gravity, effective point particle action, action and uh, we need a gauge fixing because there are too many degrees of freedom, right, in, in, uh, uh, in the metric, even at this level and harmonic gauge, the donder and so on, I think it is good also uh, uh, at this level. Then you can expand your, uh, your metric in, uh, in H, the local uh, field perturbation. You also want to start noticing that uh, when you have uh, spatial and time derivatives, the time derivatives locally will be suppressed by one power of V with respect to the spatial derivatives. Okay, because uh, this is under the assumption that the sources are, are moving slowly, at least they're not relativistically, uh, moving relativistically locally, which is an assumption of Pn. Um, so we rewrite, we, we did this already actually for the, for the action of the uh, perturbation. You get this uh, trace uh, reversal projectors that really simplify the expression. And uh, here I, I split the, uh, the spatial Laplacian-like uh, derivative with the, the more time derivative, um, because this lets, lets you write a propagator that looks kind of like the um, Newton's propagator, but now you have to account for the presence of the time derivatives. Since these are suppressed, uh, at the leading order, they don't come in, you can write a series for them that, uh, that uh, represents the effect of the time derivatives, and uh, um, EFT folks call these uh, propagator insertions. So they, they will each uh, be uh, suppressed by a power of V squared, since they are two times derivative with respect to earlier one. Okay, moving forward, uh, this is convenient, you know, it, it already looks like a, a relativ relativistic field on a flat background that propagates uh, as a wave and so on. But it turns out that uh, locally it, uh, it makes things much easier for you to, uh, to split the components of the metric perturbation into uh, Cohn and Smolkin introduced these and they call these Kaluza Klein variables. Uh, there's a scalar potential that looks like a Newtonian potential just in a, in a quasi-Newtonian metric. There's a gravitomagnetic field that uh, is the same one that uh, uh, you, you can use to describe say the precession right over uh, gyroscopes uh, around the Earth or so on, and then there's a three metric field. So you separate these and uh, you, you, sp you split out your terms and the coupling to the point masses also gets split up. Um, and by the, the tensor quality of this, uh, these components, you, you get different pairings. So if you have to, to, to couple to mass or to uh, mass V squared or mass V fourth, you need to use this, this color, okay? But if you need to couple to the velocity components, uh, you'll use the tensor part of the, uh, of the field variables. And now you can write propagators for all three types. You come up with, uh, you know, different kind of wiggles and you can, uh, the corresponding Feynman diagrams and Feynman rules, um, these are all, you know, one over k squared propagators at the leading order, and you can write the couplings uh, of the matter um, word lines to the, uh, to the different types of field. And then again, uh, you build all terms of the action using these ingredients, uh, using the, the Feynman diagrams that work by, um, uh, well, you, you, you need to do all three level uh, connected diagrams. So if you have, um, you, you need uh, at, at the leading order, 1 pn, so a power of v squared above the uh, Newtonian term, you get the uh, relativistic correction to the energy, uh, kinetic energy, and then you get uh, a, a term that looks like a Newton's potential, but actually couples a mass to a velocity squared, to, so to an energy, effectively. Uh, you, you get a term, uh, terms that couple nonlinearly one mass to two, uh, to 
the other mass twice, uh, you get a vector potential uh, term that couples the two velocities of the body, and you get the first propagator insertion on top of the standard uh, uh, Newton potential. And things like this, you know, that involve self-energy, again, will give you uh, integrals that uh, are formally divergent, but that you can uh, regularize with dimensional regularization. And then you start uh, evaluating these, and they involve integrals that, at this level, 1pn are, are very simple. Um, basically, a, a Fourier transform, again, of 1 over k squared gives you a modified, uh, uh, now, uh, Newton's law, because it includes the velocity squares. Um, second one is this nonlinear interaction, double integral it actually factorizes and it gets your next order a term that is a potential but has a mass cubed and a orbital radius squared. Uh, these ones I don't even show you the integral but you get a, a term that uh, couples the two velocities, right? Out of this that has to look like that. The, the only thing you can have a radius and the dot product of the two velocities and, uh, and uh, a, a another term that actually uses velocities and radius uh, together. And th that's the, the velocity comes in because remember, this is the rel relativistic uh, delay effect on top of the standard propagator. All together, this thing get you, uh, with a small number of pages of work, let's say, get you the einstein hilfen hoffman uh, um, action which uh, Luke reminded me yesterday was, had actually been de derived by Drost uh, 20 years before, already in the, the 1910s. Um, Einstein, I looked up Einstein Infeld, that, that paper, that paper is, is, a, is 100 pages to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's very detailed, lots of things about what this component does, that component does, and so on. But it's also sophisticated because it uses surface integral method that actually can deal with uh, even black holes because you never go to the to the singularity. You just worry about what uh, the field around them. Yes. The equations of motion in the case uh, in the uh, Einstein field of final mm -hmm. because I thought uh, they didn't uh, really derive the Lagrangian, but just the equations of motion. Computer. Yeah, they, they probably work at the level of equation motion, yes. But, but they do, I think they do write the Lagrangian, don't they? They're ba backwards? I, I thought they're not, but we, we can look at I, it. I don't know, yeah. Clearly, I, I looked at it, but I, I got a, an impressionistic <laughs> view <laughs> since I cannot answer this question. Uh, and then 2pn, you know, you can go on to 2pn and you have more, uh, more diagrams, but the point is that uh, this calculation is now systematized. Uh, you, have a, a, you have a power counting scheme where your propagators, your vertices, and so on, uh, you associate powers of uh, really velocity with it. And so you can, uh, you can systematically write all the diagrams that come in at a certain uh, uh, order in the post Newtonian expansion. Uh, at 2pn, there are three topologies. There, there's one that involves 1g. I, I wasn't writing it because it was equal to 1, but uh, uh, these are basically all single propagator, you know, interactions. And uh, here you start to, to bifurcate your propagators and it gets you G, G squared and so on. Um, I think this computation is, is done or almost done up to 4 p.m. now, in, at least in the conservative uh, uh, scheme. It's also EFT shines or has shown, <laughs> uh, especially for spin, uh, where again the uh, the classical computations get very complicated, uh, but here it's uh, it, it's easier to, to to write the you know the vertices that involve spin spin interactions, and uh, then the final step in the tower of theories uh, is where we want to do radiation, and as I said, the description is that of a composite uh, particle, composite object which has uh, um, multiple moments uh, the couple to, to the field at the distance. Now, you don't know what these are, but there's a, there's a shortcut, uh, which is uh, uh, you, you go back to the action that we wrote at the level of the uh, binary, you, uh, and you look at the terms that involve these long distance uh, field perturbations. And now, the, by definition, the variation of the action with respect to that field is the uh, effective uh, stress energy tensor. So the effective source for that field. That coupling is what is the only thing that can generate the, the, the long wavelength. Uh, and so you, to, to, 
to do the to get the multiples, you want to expand locally the the metric or the and, and, and the field itself, and that what that's what gives you the multiple integrals. But so uh, in practice, you again look at diagrams, and you look at diagrams that have one free uh, propagator line, uh, which is uh, which is these terms here, a single linear coupling to the field. And at the leading order, Newtonian order, you get uh, effectively the classic uh, mass, point mass uh, multiples. Uh, T00 is just uh, locally the masses. Now localized, not localized at the, uh, at the location of the binary, not at their individual locations. Okay, so this is the total mass, effectively. And then uh, momentum and the uh, quadruple tensor, which is the familiar expression. But Again, by writing these, uh, uh, these diagrams, you can also look at corrections, okay? And so if you go up 1 pi, one, one pn, uh, what diagram looks like that uh, with, with a higher order? Well, it's a little small here, but this is a coupling to velocity squared. So basically, the uh, kinetic energy is a source for is, is mass, and therefore source is monopole for... And then uh, the next one is, uh, uh, is, is an in interaction a Coulomb, sorry, a Newton interaction with an open uh, uh, loop. And uh, you also can source the external field from the local field itself. Okay, so this would be the Newton's potential as a source. And uh, so, so this is the, then the, the 1 pn correction to the energy or to the mass that comes in as a multiple for the, uh, for the field. Um, this looks a bit, the formulas for this are not a bit complicated, but, but the, the scheme again is, is very straightforward. And now let's go back to to look <laughs> to uh, this is the and to to those computations. This is the three pn Lagrangian uh, obtained with classic methods. It's not quite the same as uh, as what you get in EFT because here there are terms, for instance, proportional to uh, um, accelerations that you don't have in the EFT Lagrangian. But they give by variation they give the same equations of motion. Okay, and uh, uh, and there's a there's also a transformation, a clear transformation you can apply. But this is what you work with, okay, up to 3n, uh, 3pn order. It's, uh, it's what you use to generate your precise uh, waveform. And uh, when, um, when people used to, uh, to have actual slides, you know, transparencies, um, uh, Richard Price had, had, a, had a very cute gag where he would just show something like this and say, so, oh, wait a minute, I, uh, the factor of two I need to fix there. It's, uh, it's clear, must be clear to all of you. Um, so to make a waveform, uh, you, uh, you actually need more than the, you need the Lagrangian, you also need the flux, the loss of energy. If you make it an adiabatic waveform that goes by balance of uh, energy and flux. And uh, to the same order, this is the, the phasing okay, of the, the waveform. So the instantaneous phase of the binary as a function of the uh, angular velocity, effectively, or the, the, the velocity of the, of the binary. And then uh, the, your generalized uh, um, form for the, for the equation in, is a sum over a multipolar components to the gravitational waves. So the first, the first piece is what comes out of the quadruple coupling to the field, up uh, the first term here, but then there are more terms here, right, that couple to higher multiples and to current multiples. And that those all come in the description of the, um, the waveform itself as a post-Newtonian sum at uh, increasing orders. And that x there is a, is a velocity uh, parameter. So it's the, the post-Newtonian order effectively. Uh, modern uh, waveforms that are used to analyze uh, black holes with LIGO do go up uh, orders, several orders here, even in, in, the, uh, in the multipolar expansion. And this, I don't think you can read it, but this is uh, something that Luke in his review does. And it shows uh, for, uh, say, can we make this bigger? I'll probably do it. So, link to front. Sorry. Link to front. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you can look at a, um, a gravitational waveform for either a Newton star, Newton star binary, or Newton star black hole, or black hole, black hole. You look at it from where it enters the, say, the LIGO Virgo band at 20 hertz to where it exits, and you count how many cycles uh, of oscillation are uh, provided by each, uh, 
this is very high so uh, this is probably from some low lower frequency actually I, I should look it up maybe it's one hertz or five hertz something like that um, because we don't see 15,000 cycles of uh, <laughs> radiance of waveform even for a neutron star neutron star but anyway the 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 notion here is that higher orders give you a, a smaller and smaller numbers of cycles however to uh, what you're sensitive to detect a, a waveform you, you need to align every single cycle okay you cannot lose a cycle because then your template is of phase and you start losing uh, the overlap you start losing the power and so on so that's a uh, that would be the propaganda demonstration that you need to go up to 3.5 p.m. Uh, and do all these complicated calculations to, to use them in practice okay and uh, then there are uh, very beautiful uh, effects coming in at higher post Newtonian orders there, there are things like tails and tails of tails they uh, they involve the reflection of the uh, field the gravitational waves in the potential gravitational potential itself uh, memory comes in, I think, at uh, 2.5 p.m. No, I just had a question just to make uh, this yes. plot, um, this um, table more precise. Mm -hmm. So does, uh, does this mean, for instance, that um, 1 p.m. becomes higher than some percentage of the signal? I don't know, 10% at the 439 cycle or? Um, no, I think 1 pn remains smaller. So, so you're saying it, it could cross where the 1 pn terms is, is higher than the... So ca can, you, can you explain again and maybe this... Uh... Uh, I, I think this is just saying you look at this expression for, uh, this yeah. expression for the phase in there. Exactly. And uh, if you, you just see how many cycles it contributes between exactly. the frequency con and the end. What does it mean contributes? Uh, up to what percent uh, of uh, I think it means uh, this is a phasing expression so you, you take for instance this is 1 pn yeah uh, you take actually no this is 1 pn this is 1 pn yeah. that's 1 pn you take this between x of uh, corresponding to 5 hertz and x of uh, you know 1000 hertz something like that and you see that term so now they could can they cancel each other so so maybe that's that's part of why why these numbers are so big but uh, mm. uh, I think that's the idea. Hmm? So I, I mean, you, you have you have uh, you you care about phi across the waveform, but uh, you say I, I take phi at the end, if I if I there, uh, how how much how big is each term? Yes. So it's it's not a very precise. Uh, it, you can do anything. You cannot do anything with this other than than say if I if I wasn't doing three point five pn, I would be off. I could be off by one uh, one radian at the end. Okay, we survived through my EFT <laughs> description, but it's uh, I, I do think it's uh, I do think it's pretty. I do think it's uh, uh, and, and I, I think even um, even Luke and Amour recognized that it was a useful contribution to the field that brought some new calculation efforts. Although they also point out that the diagrammatic uh, uh, diagrammatic techniques similar to Feynman were in use already in uh, in the literature, just uh, just not tied to the formal field theory language, and uh, and and perhaps not so much to power counting and to uh, and to the idea of doing dimensional regularization and so on. So okay, so then uh, this is a second topic for today so maybe we can break a little early and come back at 11.05 no English English <laughs> that's what you get you have too many Italian friends in, in the audience uh, so I, I was looking up this thing about the tidal numbers of black holes so the uh, the matching calculations show that uh, all the log numbers vanish meaning that you you you, you don't couple to any derivative squared of uh, Riemann at any order. Mm -hmm. So the first coupling is uh, at the, the cubic, uh, a term that's cubic in Riemann. Um, and uh, um, even that one, at least at the time of, <laughs> of, of the papers I've read, that, that those coefficients had not been computed. So the, the nonlinear tidal deformations. So they may be now, but uh, so it was unknown whether the, these were zero. They could also be zero. Numbers. Nonlinear, nonlinear log numbers. 
So the, the term that couples to something like A is the triple A. Okay, and uh, you probably need to do some, some matching of indices there to make them come out. So these, I think, they, they call them uh, CEE. -E. Okay, so moving on, testing GR. Um, that was always the, the promise, you know, gravitational wave detection was that uh, it would give you a handle on uh, a, an experimental handle on, uh, on GR complementary to the tests that uh, we can do in the solar system from, uh, from pulsars, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, with clocks <laughs> in orbit and uh, everything that uh, we can do. And the, especially so because the, the first, uh, again, the, first, the initial detection uh, showed a very, uh, a very good match to theoretical uh, uh, expressions. So, so you had this, uh, this idea, oh, we can make very precise uh, predictions for what the waveforms are going to be using post-Newtonian and all that. We can compare and so we, get, we can get very fine tests of general relativity predictions. And uh, what I was going to say, and the, uh, the propaganda <laughs> usually says, uh, and look, this is very special because we can test uh, GR in uh, where no man has gone before. You can go to, to very high um, curvatures, right? And for an isolated body, something M, M over uh, size cubed and uh, compactness, okay? So just mass over, over radius. So also very dynamic of GR because when black holes merge, uh, it's uh, the, the final merger is, is not uh, uh, an adiabatic process. You've got lots of degrees of freedom you know, working together. Now, uh, gravitational waves are uh, actually generic prediction of uh, pretty much any Lorentz invariant, not, not invariance, invariant, sorry, metric theory of gravitation, just because you have, uh, you know, space and time derivatives and together those tend to make waves for you. But in other theories, they may differ from GR in their generation, uh, in their propagation and their polarization, okay? Unfortunately, there is no simple framework like parameterized post-Newtonian, which is what used for uh, the solar system uh, dynamics to describe strongly gravitating radiative systems. And uh, there are few models, uh, there, there, are, there are few theories of modified gravity where you can uh, uh, do a, a systematic model of uh, bi binary dynamics and, and so on. So, um, Filippo, for instance, teach, teaches me that you start having screening problems. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult, right, to do the analog of uh, what, what we did in theories that are perhaps a bit more interesting than, say, a, a standard, a, a simple scalar tensor theories. But still, you know, gravitational wave data analysis, you really wanted to test GR. Uh, because of this opportunity we have. And so, so far, they have uh, then defaulted to uh, characterizing the accuracy either parametrically or non-parametrically, okay? So if you don't have parameters, uh, you test something that you call consistency. So is what I find uh, consistent with what the GR um, gives me? And uh, I, I actually have a big problem with this because uh, Consistency is not a well-defined statistical uh, notion, okay? So I can, uh, uh, I, I, I will expatiate on, on why it's not. Uh, the other way is you modify GR in some arbitrary directions, and then you, you try to constrain those, those uh, variations, but that's also not very satisfying because uh, uh, what are you testing, okay? You're testing some, uh, some made-up model that you made for yourself. So in, over the last years, you know, I tend to be one of the skeptic voices about testing GR uh, because you, you do many things because you can, but uh, in the end, they don't say very much, I think. Some do. So let's start with consistency, okay? So the idea is to come up with a measure of how much what you observe matches what you expect. Uh, and uh, if, you're, if you do it well, you can build a p-value. You know, we talked about hypothesis testing last time. The idea is uh, you have your known model, in this case it's GR, you draw out some observable on it, and you, you try to see how rare 
uh, how unlikely it is that you'd get that from GR. If it's very unlikely, then maybe probably GR should be wrong. Okay, if you're popper, you should say that uh, I reject GR because it fails my hypothesis testing. In practice, I don't believe we would we would ever believe an inconsistent result because there are so many other things in there. There's your experiment, there's your modeling on the waveforms, there are effects that uh, you, you're neglecting because they're too complicated to uh, to include. For instance. Uh, many things, but if, if it's not something in the detector, it may be something in the astrophysics. Maybe there's a third body near the binary that's doing something. Maybe there's gas that's... Uh, any of those things are, I would say, a priori more likely than GR is wrong <laughs> because it's been confirmed so well and in so many, uh, um, so many different arenas so far and because we don't have an alter a, a well-founded alternative okay, that, uh, that we can turn to. But let's look at a, at a, uh, a characteristic, a, a typical test of consistency. So I describe uh, in spiral merger ring down waveforms. The spiral is the slow adiabatic thing where frequency is increasing, then the two black holes merge, uh, and then uh, the, the final black hole dies, uh, has a, a fluctuation that dies down. So one thing you can do is you can say, uh, let's, let me estimate the uh, masses and spins of the system from the spiral. From those estimates, I can calculate what the final mass and spin will be of the final merged black hole. Let me estimate that separately from the end of the merger and from the ring down and see if the two things match. Okay, and so that's, uh, and, and then people come up with the uh, quantities that describe this match or mismatch. So something like a difference of, uh, um, of the in spiral and post in spiral mass and in spiral effective spin, aligned spin and post in spiral spin. And you know you can uh, you can you can draw them, and uh, and now you know you get posteriors that more or less match, and you're happy. That's uh, okay. My I'm consistent. Uh, GR is verified. But how much uh, is this? Uh, was there a chance that it would ever not match when you did this? Um, and you say then you say if I have many events, I can actually use all of them together to constrain uh, how how well. Uh, my findings, experimental findings, uh, match my predictions. Now you have a problem though, because uh, um, there's no reason that in different binaries, even if you're violating GR, you should have the same violations of the, uh, this, of this mismatch between the initially estimated mass and the final one. Okay, so people do, because you, you can do it, just multiply all those, uh, those posteriors together, those likelihoods, and say, this is taking all the events together and assuming that uh, uh, the um, discrepancy is the same for all, we can, you know, bound it tighter to, to this, uh, this kind of gray histograms here. And then also people try to be a little more subtle and do a, one of these hierarchical schemes I, I was telling you about. Uh, so it would be something like, uh, okay, so you have uh, signal and noise that give you your data. Uh, you'll have the astrophysical parameters that determine what signal you have. To this, we're going to add uh, this discrepancy measure, so delta M and uh, uh, delta chi. Okay, so you can try by looking at many uh, detections, you can try to estimate these two and assume they're all the same. Or you can put hierarchical parameter on top of that, something like uh, mu delta m, sigma delta m, and the same thing for chi. So you say, okay, they're not all the same, but they're drawn from a distribution, simple normal distribution, that allows them to, uh, to, to vary in different events, and let's see. So that's what you have uh, down here. So this mu and sigma, uh, these, I think, is for spin. So this is the uh, these hierarchical parameters. So uh, so you say, the, I can characterize the population of these consistency parameters with the mean that is consistent with zero and with the variance that is consistent with zero. So basically, uh, this is a fancier way to say that's zero. I estimate them to be zero. But that there's no physical basis, right, to, to formulate things like this. It's just something you can do. Um, another consistency check that uh, is, is a little bit uh, more uh, well-founded is to say, 
I have my data, it's noise plus signal. Let me subtract out my best estimate of the signal using the best parameters I have. What's left should be just noise. Okay, is it just noise? Uh, you can do a simple, I think it's called, called Mogorov test to see if uh, the, the variance, the distribution of, the, of what you have is consistent. We know that's not very powerful just because there's so much noise. There, there are, there are, there, there's a very large number of degrees of freedom for noise. Uh, there are few, few, degree, few degrees of freedom for signal that are the ones that you extract by the match filtering and so on. So it always looks like noise that way. So, uh, so what people have uh, thought about doing is uh, uh, you have your residual, which should be only noise. You look for another signal in there. Uh, you do a wavelet description of something that's a coherent signal into detectors, and you see if, uh, if you can extract any phenomenological waveform that looks like it's there, <laughs> okay? If you can extract something, then uh, your, your prediction for the waveform was probably wrong because there's extra structure there that you have not subtracted out. And you can characterize this then as a residual SNR, so the SNR of this uh, apparent structure left in the, in the, in the data, uh, and you plot it, these are all the LIGO events, it's plotted as a function of the signal to noise of the signal itself, and uh, of the residual SNR, and then you can try to build your background by saying, uh, um, let me just look in pure noise away from the signals, how, how much coherent structure do I find just because, okay? And uh, so your p-values are actually very well distributed from zero to one, right? The p-value, um, if uh, your null model is correct, and you test it many times, what you should get is a distribution of p-values that uniform between zero and one. That's uh, by definition, that's what, what you get. Um, in practice, you know, you can also use this uh, residual SNR to put a bound on how well you're modeling your signal. So it's a bound. It's, uh, you're probably doing better than that, but you, you do know that you're doing better than that. So fitting factor is, um, let's say, fitting factor is, uh, remember our fits are, are overlaps between uh, data and, and uh, template. You align the signals as much as possible. Fitting factor is where you don't quite have the, the, the same signal. You have a different family of signal that's uh, uh, approximated perhaps, or perhaps it doesn't have all the parameters and so on. So it won't look exactly like the waveform you really have in the data, but you find the one that fits the best. Okay, so uh, then what you find that you can translate if you say that all this residual structure, coherent structure that you find, is all due to a, a difference in, in the very signal that you have, you can uh, basically put a number on how well you're, uh, you're reproducing what you see in the data, a limit on that. And for LIGO events, for a few, the strongest one, you, you can say that you do better than 5%. For most of them, you can, you can say that you perhaps do better than 10% which is not a lot, okay, because we, I, I just advertised how you need to, to go to 3.5 p.m. in order to very precise uh, templates and so on to match uh, to have a fighting chance. Um, and now what we get here, we can only demonstrate that we do better than a few percent in matching the signal. And that's due to these uh, SNRs, which are not very high, okay, 20 and, and so on, very high statistical certainty you have something, but not a lot of resolving power into what it actually is, uh, phase by uh, cycle by cycle. Okay, let's move on. Consistency, so not so satisfying, but at least it gets you p-value. Parametric. Okay, let's uh, let's say uh, I, I I have my template, my signal as a function of the masses, the spins, and so on. Uh, let's change it somehow. Uh, how shall uh, and uh, typically, this is where it started with the idea of uh, your post-Newtonian coefficient. This is another way to write the phasing of your waveform. It's a little simpler than what I had before, but this is yet another sum over post-Newtonian terms. There's a power of a frequency there that gives you the post-Newtonian orders. And there are numbers here that are, shall I go back all the way, that are uh, these numbers here. Okay, these very pretty high, <laughs> huge fractions. Um, that um, I actually asked Luke yesterday, so um, I told him th these, these waveforms are, are, are pretty because where else in physics you find a fraction of uh, 11 billion 757 da 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 over 9 million and so on. And 
He told me that you do have the same thing in cosmological perturbations. So in some expansions, I, I turn that over to you. I'm not, uh, not sure, but it's, uh, okay. So which would be good actually, since my son is studying, fra studying fractions right now and he's going three fourths plus seven fifths and so on. I say, look at that. <laughs> That's what real science uses. <laughs> Now simplify that if you can. <laughs> Factor it. So anyway, so these are numbers, okay? And uh, so just phenomenologically, you change them. You say the, the 1.5 post Newtonian term is 4 pi. I'm going to do 4 pi plus 0.1. And I, I, so I let it free. It's I, one, you can do it for all of them except you, you cannot resolve anything anymore. So the way they, 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 they do it is, is to do, do them one by one and say, okay, let's try changing the, uh, the Newtonian order to f from the function it should be of masses to something else. Let's add this term dipole radiation, which is at the minus one post Newtonian is actually not in the GR waveform. Let's add one there. And, uh, and so then from the data, one by one, you get posteriors for what these parameters should look like. Uh, so, so what this, uh, sorry, what this deviation can be. Um, uh, and then uh, you have multiple events. You say, okay, maybe let's try to see if they're all the same, what my combined posterior is, or let's try to do a hierarchical scheme where I let them change a little bit. Because after all, why should these deviations be the same in different binaries with different masses and different spins? I don't know where they come from. So it's a, it's, it's a very restrictive thing. So. In practice, they say, ah, we're consistent. These posteriors always include zero, which is the GR prediction. In practice, it means very little, okay? It, it only would, even if you found the violation where one of these violin plots is way away from zero, uh, what does it tell you? Okay, so the, the best you can do here is to note that uh, in some theories like massive gravity, dynamical churn simons where you cannot quite do the full job of modeling the binary, still you can estimate the leading order and it should come in at some post-Newtonian uh, order. Same for uh, massive graviton, okay? Some effect, leading order effect, you can, you can see this way. Um, so much that uh, uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues from LIGO actually did, uh, 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 wrote a paper that I, I, I was perhaps meant to be I'm not sure if it was meant to be funny or what, but he said, hey, look, uh, one of these coefficients here is uh, four pi. Okay, so we can actually use gravitational wave estimations to estimate experimentally the value of pi. And you do that and you get 3.1 plus or minus 0.2. And, uh, so <laughs> um, I, I think he, he uh, I think he thought it was cool but uh, then, then my, my, postdoc, my postdoc, Alvin, said, okay, let's, let's have a response where we estimate the value of one. Because any constant here, you can, uh, you can treat it as a free parameter. It doesn't mean anything, right? And not only that, how well you do, uh, if, uh, if you estimate the value of one cubed, you can get a better precision <laughs> than if you estimate the value of one. It's just you get a constant in, in the error. It doesn't mean anything, right? It's, it's uh, the, the only place where I think this has a, a meaning is if you can link, link it to physical quantities that come from somewhere else. So graviton mass, I guess, maybe is, is a case where you can. Otherwise, okay, you're establishing consistency in this parametric way. Uh, it's not entirely devoid of value because um, if it doesn't come out right, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> so you're not so much testing GR, you're testing your stack of approximations and your experiment and so on. So maybe that's valuable, but it's not testing GR because you never believe that uh, evaluation basically based on these kind of things. Uh, similar one that uh, is uh, to do, uh, to change your dispersion law. So uh, if, uh, the, if you, you just in GR, you just have uh, E squared equal P, P, P squared C squared. You can add a term with this slightly awkward uh, real power of the uh, of the momentum uh, there's a special case where alpha is zero here which is the uh, where you estimate the mass of the graviton and you make an argument to say uh, since the we know from solar system experiment that the effective wavelength of the graviton is very very long probably it's not going to affect the uh, the dynamics of the binary itself which is smaller but it will affect
affect the, the propagation of, uh, of the field uh, with a term, a, a, an effective phase term, which is, uh, uh, is a dephasing term, right? Because it's, it's proportional to, to frequency. It comes from writing, uh, from using this uh, dispersion law to write the velocity. And it's proportional to the distance to the binary also. So you, you're decently sensitive to, to, to this. It's, uh, it's a factor of a few better than the solar system uh, uh, tests, which are also based on a, a pretty naive, uh, I, I think, uh, approximation. They, they just replace uh, Newton with uh, Yukawa, right? And uh, with an effective uh, exponential, or, or, but, but at least it's an electron volt, <laughs> right? It, 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 it ties to physics somewhere else. It's not just a pure number that has no scale and that uh, just tells you that you have the right uh, Fraction there. Okay. Yes. Uh, with the final gravity mass. To 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 for this test. For so this for test. So how is this justified, given that uh, there are more degrees of freedom, not just the graviton, not just the transverse modes? And they are actually strongly coupled. Hand waving, but but uh, for the graviton, you say if the wavelength is very long, then no, but no, not enough. No, because you have five degrees of freedom, not two. So the number of degrees of freedom coupled to matter changes the symmetry of, of the of, of the field. You're saying the propagator is different. There's also all the propagator that story, is different. Yeah. The dynamic yeah. is yeah. So yeah. the extra dynamic doesn't decouple with the mass uh, set, setting it to zero. Just screening effects, but for binaries, people, I, I don't think, uh, uh, have these, any clue. These kind of discussions are not very sophisticated. No, Filippo, I don't in, know. In, uh, Philippe for, for, for binaries, I don't think there's a... Uh... For binaries, uh, okay. With, with, with the screening... Uh, okay, that, that's basically the result none. So there's, uh, there's also one thing I didn't put in the slide, which is a, which is a bit of a catch-22, which is um, if... If you really had effects that, that change physics a lot, you never detect the events. Okay, so the um, so so kind of by design, you have to look at small changes, small perturbations for from from GR, and uh, so maybe this is the case. So so it, it may be that in some theories of massive gravity, and the the dynamics is so different that uh, the the spiral has a completely different power, so we just don't see it. We we. Um, there are some, uh, you know, safeguards against that. So there are searches that are known uh, unmodeled for signals. So a sufficiently small, uh, sufficiently short and, and quick in spiral, you would see it uh, just by a search that uses a, a wavelet decomposition of the signal and requires a, a consistency, coherency between the two detectors. But something like uh, Newton star, Newton star, which has many, many cycles and where you really need to do to integrate up your power, you wouldn't see that way. You, you, you really need to, to, to have the waveform that matches the cycles. Another one, ring down. So I, I, I started writing up the <laughs> a slide about the perturbative uh, equations that uh, describe black hole perturbations. And um, it got too complicated. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> it, it would have, uh, you, you can look them up in Chandrasekhar or, or other books. Uh, they, they do have one of those miracles that you get in uh, um, partial differential equations, which is uh, um, you write a very complex metric perturbation, which needs to have the right symmetries, uh, you know, terms that, uh, um, scalar terms and, and vector terms and so on. And you, do, you find that in, in just the right parameterization, the, the spatial sector decouples from, uh, from radial and time. So basically, a multipolar uh, description is possible for perturbations over a black hole. At least Schwarzschild, that, that's uh, easiest there. Um, and then there are master equations for your uh, radial perturbations, which are, which are the Matske-Wheeler, Matske-Wheeler, no, sorry, uh, Wheeler, the Zerilli equation and the and Reggie Wheeler, not Mask, Reggie Wheeler <laughs> equations. And you can compute then uh, your quasi normal modes, which are quasi normal because the frequency are actually complex. Okay, so there's a, there's a, um, a perturbation, a, a dissipation term, a friction term that uh, for which the once excited the normal modes just decay. Uh, 
uh, naturally. And uh, the, the leading mode, the one that, that should be the strongest in binary, is uh, 220, okay, L number of 2, M number of 2, and so on. Uh, so you can look for, um, again, perturbations to the value of the frequency and the damping time of this fundamental mode with respect to the value predicted in GR, which is a function of the mass and spin of the, of the final black hole. And uh, again, you find the result that uh, it is awkward because there's no, the zero is not on the, on the ticks, but it's here. Okay, so this would have never passed my review if I, <laughs> because I'm very difficult with plots, uh, so on. So anyway, it's consistent with zero, whatever consistent means. Joint posterior is also close. Uh, you can you can get the p-value from most binaries. This is not as clean, perhaps, as you like in terms of, uh, but it, it's uh, it's fine. Okay, so you don't you don't see very much. What's interesting here is that uh, you can see this as a test of GR. You can also see see it as a test of the uh, black hole ness of the uh, of the objects themselves. So if uh, it could there could be these echoes, right? Uh, extreme compact objects. Not a black hole, but some kind of boson star or a strange star, and so on. Something that's small enough to behave like a black hole, uh, but differs in uh, in terms of its fundamental modes. So, uh, in that sense, maybe it's a, it's a little more significant. Okay. Um, maybe if you find a discrepancy here, you'd have a case that uh, that it's not a black hole. Um, I wanted to compare quickly, the formulas are a bit smaller, but the, these are the, the classic tests of GR using compact objects before we had gravitational waves. So these are tests from the binary pulsar, uh, PSR J0737. This is the, I, I showed this the other day as well, it's from, from the original Hulse-Taylor pulsar uh, that showed the loss of energy to, to, to gravitational radiation. and. Uh, in a way, so here you're doing the same thing, right, as, as we're doing with gravitational waves. So, so this is the model for those post-Newtonian uh, um, post tests, that there's a prediction uh, as a function of the two masses. You have a curve for what these uh, post-Keplerian parameters should be, the precession of the orbit, the, uh, the change in the, in the orbital period. I forget what gamma is. Uh, anyway. Um, and then you say, oh, we can see this, but you can measure this parameter in a part uh, in 10 to the 7, and these other parameters in a part in 10 to the 8. This is always also somewhat uh, arbitrary, if you wish, because there's no comparison for that. Uh, you don't have an alternative theory that sets a scale for the number that would be interesting. So maybe a weak interpretation for this, as for the test of GR, is just to say, okay, my theory, actually, no, my experiment is good enough that it can uh, that I <laughs> it can it can measure this parameter that it, it 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 requires a modeling of that specific parameter to better than a part in a thousand. Okay, so in the sense it, it sets a scale for the predicted power of the theory with the experiments that you have. Okay, so that's not testing GR though. That's uh, that's kind of saying uh, this is the precision that ha that I have at this point when I compare predictions to to the experiment. Okay, alternative theories. Um, if you if you do have a fully predicted alternative theory, you can compare what you get with what you do expect. Uh, you do have a problem here because of priors. I think I was talking about them already. Uh, Bayesian model comparison is, uh, finds its uh, raison d'être in uh, uh, embedding, okay, odds, like in gambling. So it, uh, it lets you compare uh, two different uh, hypotheses. Am I playing with a fair die or is my die or my coin weighted, okay? Uh, if, you, if you know what the, the relative hypotheses are to start with, then uh, after you, you play with the die and you throw your coin, you can update your, uh, um, your subjective uh, probabilities for, for those two hypotheses. Here, it's, it's difficult. What is the prior probability of Kerr Simons, dynamical Kerr Simons, with respect to GR? Is it small because I've tested GR so much? 
Is it small because Kern Simons is actually kind of ugly in, in that uh, it, uh, it's not fully dynamical or there are problems and so on? No way to tell. Okay, so these base factors then become, again, uh, very arbitrary. And I don't know that there's a level to which you'd actually believe an alternative theory over GR just because you find a, a high base factor. Yes? Basically, if you had a lot of data, you should not be dependent uh, on PIOS, right? Uh, or So it's true that likelihood can overwhelm any prior, mm -hmm. and that uh, you have a low large numbers if you want. Where uh, the problem with that is that uh, it's not just statistical error, right? The problem is also systematic error. Yeah, yeah. This and is why I say you need a lot of data, but, but eventually. It, well, I mean, if you have a systematic error, even with lots mm -hmm. of data, it would it would move all of it, all of your experiments, let's say, mm -hmm. and 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 it's not GR that's wrong. So. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, lots of very good data. I, but I, I don't know. It's at some point you get out of the numbers and probabilities and so on, and you have to think about uh, your theories from from another point of view. Um, this is Filippo's slide, <laughs> so, so I can't really do it justice. But uh, uh, Filippo and colleagues wrote uh, the most general modified uh, gravity effective action. Uh, that is Lorentz invariance, it's a scalar tensor theories with second order equation of motions and terms that uh, avoid some instabilities. So this is, uh, I think this is all in that effective field theory, from that effective viewpoint, it's, it's, it's all the terms you can build that, uh, uh, that fit your, your, your theory. And then uh, uh, Filippo and colleagues were actually able to show that uh, um, measurements from LIGO starting with the speed of gravitational wave which came from the binary neutron star uh, event in the August of 2017 where we saw waves coming and then with a very small delay we saw also gamma rays and, uh, and, and other radiation so that puts a limit on the difference between the speed of gravity and the speed of light and that uh, very small actually because you, you, um, you, you get an amplification factor of the distance to the, uh, to the system. And so start uh, by looking at the prediction of this gen general, very general theories for the speed of gravity and comparing that to, to LIGO. You can start to exclude terms, to kill off terms effectively from speed of gravity, from uh, the fact that uh, the gravitational waves do not decay, they're not dispersed and they don't decay as they reach you. So you still see them. <laughs> and also instabilities, uh, these are instabilities of the, the waves themselves again, right? right? Or, or, or the binary. Uh, no, it's instability of uh, this term. the dark energy. Of the dark energy, okay. So uh, this, which is something that uh, uh, is, is quite orthogonal perhaps to the kind of tests that the gravitational wave data analysis people do, to me, seems quite satisfying. I mean, it's it's uh, you you do <laughs> yes, you do constrain a large uh, uh, sector of a theory that, admittedly, maybe it was fantasy to start with because <laughs> the, the 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 whole point is I I let anything I can imagine that uh, that works. But uh, um, although I suppose for dark energy you can do nice things with all these terms, you can uh, you can write. Anyway, so this, I, I don't know it well enough because uh, I, I've uh, read the papers and didn't really understand it very well, but I, it looks to me successful. So <laughs> go see, yeah, see, yeah. Yeah, see yeah. Uh, But going back to, to LIGO and so on, uh, alternative theories would predict different polarizations. Um, and uh, the classic thing in, in Will in Will's book is, the, is the, that he says, look, on in addition to the GR tensor term, you can also have scalar and vector uh, terms. And I, I actually quiz, quizzed Will a little bit yesterday because I, I don't quite under understand this, right? If you, if you look at the textbooks, they go through the um, derivation I gave you a few weeks ago where you do linearized equations and uh, symmetries of uh, Riemann. You get a wave equation for Riemann and then you get two polarizations only. And then they say, oh, but in, in other theories, you get six. So wh where does that come from? Where, where? And uh, all that it is, is uh, if you assume there's a wave equation and you look at, and you just apply the symmetries of Riemann on top of them, that's what you get. 
So it's a uh, you. So it doesn't tell you. You need to you need to know that the other theories do waves, and also that they propagate the speed of light basically. So so that's uh, that's an assumption when you do this kind of tests. It's, it doesn't come out of uh, say formulating a general matrix theory, or it's it's not uh, it's not fundamental in that way, which I thought it was, but uh, I, I guess it's. Uh, um, anyway, so um, the first attempts to do this were very naive. They were saying, let's pretend that uh, the, the wave that LIGO saw from the first event was not tensorial, but it was scalar, purely scalar. Okay, so then, uh, yeah, instead of doing the, 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 the plus and cross uh, alternate, it just did, did the breathing of the uh, transverse to the direction of propagation. Um, and even that, with, with only the two LIGO detectors, you couldn't tell, okay, because they're aligned. And uh, I think Virgo and so on were a li little more sensitive, but the point is that uh, if you really had a scalar theory of, uh, purely scalar theory of gravity, you probably wouldn't have the same uh, binary dynamics and wouldn't have the same waveforms. And therefore, it's a bit strange to take the tensor waveforms and make them scalar and test for that. Um, modern, more modern tests do something that's uh, uh, cleaner. They use what's called a null stream formalism, which is the idea that if you have uh, two or three observations of the field uh, and you assume a given position in the sky and a given polarization, you can combine them in a way that cancel out the, uh, the signal. Okay, and then uh, you can use that to build the likelihood. Effectively, you, you, uh, you, you try to find the parameters that cancel out as much power as you can from the signal, and you can compare different scenarios in uh, using a base factor again. And so these are the numbers, uh, and it's somewhat complicated because of the ways you can put together these different uh, polarizations. But for instance, if you com if you compare pure scalar to tensor, which again, pure scalar very suspicious. However, the base factor is uh, what is it? A hundred thousand. Okay, so doesn't look like it. It, it. it does seem we have some tensorial, uh, evidence of tensorial. Uh, but for others, it's a bit inconclusive. Tensor scalar with respect to tensor cannot quite tell them apart. And uh, this method does not make assumptions about the relative uh, strength okay, of, the, uh, of the tensor and scalar, which you don't want, because that would be a free a parameter you need to estimate in your theory. Uh, other things, vector, a vector scalar against tensor, you can exclude it, but TVS, tensor vector scalar against tensor, you can't, okay, for the moment. Okay, final thing, let me talk a bit, uh, no, not quite final, let me talk about the size of the effects that we're going after. Uh, I thought uh, the ability of uh, constraining the polarization depended also on the number of uh, interferometers oh, that yes, you have. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, 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 this okay, is with no, Three of which two are aligned, so you uh, you're going to be uh, to do better and to to be to to discriminate between them better once we have Lago India and Kagra and so on. Sure, yes. Okay. Um, which brings to mind the uh, pulsar timing a little bit because there, effectively, you have one detector in for every pulsar that you're monitoring. Uh, mm. So you'd have, uh, from this point of view, you, you'd have lots of power, except that your signal is isotropic and, and stochastic and coming from every direction. So mm. that, that complicates things. But uh, for, for a uh, uh, deterministic signal from a single binary, you could probably do this game pretty well, uh, if you have a sufficient number of good pulsars there. Okay, size of effects. Uh, this analysis I did a few years back in, in a... a uh, one of my skeptical takes on testing GR. And this is, again, one of these Bayesian networks. Uh, uh, the idea is this is the setup. I observe data. It's made of signal plus noise. Now the signal will depend on some uh, astrophysical parameters and on some modified GR parameters. So this you could call it a nested, uh, nested models because uh, this, gamma, this uh, lambda could be, for instance, the mass of the graviton. Uh, you can dial it down to zero and then you get GR, or you can move it away from zero, and then uh, you, you get an alternative theory. So if you, if you take a, a setup like that, where you have a single parameter that moves you away from GR that you want to measure, you can actually make a, a rather general uh, estimation of your Bayesian 
comparison, uh, model comparison uh, prospects. And so, yeah, we want to establish an anomaly. We want to bound this parameter away from zero, effectively, and show you not in GR. And you can, uh, you, you can then uh, uh, do it very generically without assuming a shape for the modification of GR that you, you do, just by considering what, uh, how large the modification is in, in signal space. Uh, this fictive factor I was t telling you about, so how well you can do in matching something that is GR, uh, sorry, something that's not GR with something that is. Um, and you can, uh, you can plot as a function of the SNR of your detection and of the false alarm that you're going to allow yourself, meaning false alarm 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 4 means that in 10,000, uh, over 10,000 signals, in one of them, by chance, I'm going to, it's going to look like a modified GR to me, okay? 10 to the 8, same thing in 10 to the 8. And you can then plot, uh, you can see where this false alarm curve, uh, not a curve actually, it's a parallel, lies as a function of the uh, fitting factor. And this tells you, for instance, that you have a, if you have a, an SNR of 100, between 10 and 100, with this and false alarm, you're going to detect modifications in the waveform of order 1%. Okay, in, uh, uh, for something like initial detections, you're closer to 10%. So this means that you really have a chance in initial detectors to see modified gravity that changes the waveform at the level of a few percent, which is hard to believe a priori given that there are so many other things in GR that we test to a part in 10 to the 9, a part in 10 to the 12, and so on. Um, looking forward to LISA, in LISA you'll have SNRs uh, of 1,000 and more for some of the largest black hole binaries and so on. That puts you at 10 to the minus 5, where it's arguable whether it's, uh, it's something that you could have in GR, but it's certain that it's something you cannot do right now with templates, okay, and with signals. Um, it certainly requires very careful numerical relativity. Uh, I don't think any numerical relativists who claim right now that they, they have a part in, uh, in 100,000, you know, precision, you know, accuracy in what they're doing. PN maybe gets there uh, with all those effects, but then you're, uh, you have to look at systematics, okay? So it's not just statistics, but you have to contend with all of these things, some of which I, uh, I, I discussed already a uh, couple of weeks ago. So, you know, parameters to signal to data plus noise, what if there are glitches? I don't know how to model them, they're in there. So let's, you know, let's make sure they're not there, let's try to cut them out. Calibration, what if I'm introducing a, a phase distortion in the signal, uh, in how the signal comes into the data because of the structure of my experiment? Well, you need to estimate it. Right now we can estimate it to a few percent. Um, that's not enough to get 10 to the minus 5. LISA, maybe LISA calibration is, um, LISA has been said to be self-calibrating. I, I hope it is. <laughs> this would include things like how well you're, how good orbits you have and, and uh, how well you know the laser uh, wavelength and so on. Uh, Mismodeling, so I, I, I mark this with just dot, dot, dot here, means, uh, you know, the I think I have this ca causal relation between parameters and uh, the signal. I really don't. I, I don't go high enough in PN, and uh, or I made a mistake in PN, or you know, some of the assumptions are not really valid. Astrophysical bias. There's something else there. There's another body. There's, it's a triple, or there's a, there's some kind of uh, in a neutron star the the surface cracks and gives me stresses. The excise of mode, and I'm not modeling that. It'll, it, it will change my signal. It may look like a, a, a violation of GR. Fundamental bias actually doesn't quite fit with the rest. Fundamental bias says uh, is this thing by Eunice, this idea by Eunice that if you disc if you you could have modified GR, and to you it looks like the black holes have a mass of a thousand solar masses, but they don't. You're using the wrong theory. So it's kind of like the the reverse of what I'm saying here. But my point is, uh, it's it will be a huge uh, effort to control all of this at the level, at this precision level that I was discussing before. So I do think that uh, um, the only thing that can save you is probably either luck, 
where there's some violation of GR or so, some signal to quantum gravity or something that's so specific and so unexpected that uh, it, it, uh, there's no point in, in talking about it as a 10 to minus 5 for action. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big signal. It's a big, uh, big feature. Uh, or you go around it, uh, the, these constraints that uh, in Filippo's paper, they don't need the waveform, right? They're just about uh, speed. And uh, they, they actually use the counterpart to very effectively for, uh, for, for something that uh, becomes a big effect, right, o over a long distance. So, so that's one example. Okay, so one hour of Michele being grouchy and <laughs> about this, but I, I wanted to, see, since you're, some of you are the theorists uh, thinking about modified gravity and so on, uh, I, I, I think you should know that uh, the the mainstream of doing these tests is conservative in a way, in, not conservative, it's, it's perhaps uh, it's doing some, some obvious things that are probably not very productive and it, uh, the, the, there may be an interface that's more, more interesting and more creative um, and that can, uh, can still get something out of it at this point. Okay, ah, five minutes early. So questions, who wants the cube? And also online, if you have questions, you can uh, turn on the microphone and ask. So. Ah, sorry. Oh. Um, uh, at some point you said that um, there was no certainty that one modification of uh, uh, GR, you know, detected in for one source would be the same for any other source. Um, uh, do you have an example of that? Because I, you know, I would think that you know the laws are uh, of physics are the same for all events, and only the astrophysical peculiarities of uh, each system would uh, you know make the difference. Well, let's look at one of these PN coefficients, right? So um, let's look at uh, what, what they would call what they would call uh, something like phi phi one PN is this guy thirty seven fifteen over thousand eight plus fifty five twelve eta times s. Okay, so what the scheme changes is uh, it, it does a, a fractional change like that. Okay, and, and test for that. But look, that's a physical parameter there. So already, so you have to change it. What do you change? Do you change that fraction? Okay, you make it 16. <laughs> do you change that fraction? Why should you change all of it and, and the change is not a function of the, the mass ratio? Uh, these are hard questions, right? And, and uh, uh, the I, I guess maybe if you change the if you change the, the, the top level the, the Newtonian term maybe there is one number okay it's thirty two make it thirty three <laughs> but but otherwise the, the yeah there's, there's no reason I think that these uh, because because if if you have uh, effects from a scalar charge it would come in with with the combination of the scalar charges um, maybe. The initial events were all comparable masses and so on, so, so you can make this, uh, this assumption. But otherwise, since you don't know where it comes from, it's, 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 it's dangerous to, to, to make it like this. At the point that you say, I'm going to change pi. Okay, so, and, uh, uh, oh, one. Um. Other questions? Small again, so I ruin my talk. So okay, so thanks again, uh, thank you, Michaela, okay. and see you next Friday.